Well, good morning, everybody. Before we get started this morning, I have a very, very exciting announcement to make for all of you that are in your 20s or your 30s, and that is we are launching a brand new gathering for you starting this Friday night, September 15th. It's called The Heights. Um, these gatherings are going to take place, let's say, four-ish times a semester at one of our campuses. For this very first one, I get to be there, even though I'm not technically in my 20s or 30s anymore, uh, since I, I turned 40 this last year. I just miss it. Uh, but as part of the night, we are hosting a live Ask Me Anything, and so they let me come to this very first one. Um, and to be clear, this is not only for singles. Um, single, married, engaged, if you're in your 20s or your 30s, this is for you. These these gatherings will not only help you capitalize on what God is doing in this particular chapter of your life, uh, which is significant, and there's a lot happening that you'll never get back. Um, it's also going to give you a place to meet other people that are in the same stage of life, so to speak, as you are. Um, Summit Church, all of you, listen, God has placed us in a city with a young professional demographic that is just exploding. Read anything about the Triangle area, and you will see that. And so we know that part of our mission is to reach them and to equip them to reach each other. And so to those of you in your 20s and 30s, if you did not have Friday night plans, now you do. And if you already had plans, you should cancel them because I promise this will be better. Uh, registration is not required, but it, would always, it always helps us if you do. And as always, you can do that at summitchurch.com. Bring your friends, bring your coworkers, and uh, we will see you, Lord willing, at 7 p.m. at the Briar Creek campus this Friday night. Okay? All right, all right, James chapter four, if you have your Bibles, James four, we're gonna be beginning down in verse 13. How many of you have your Bibles at all of our campuses? Just kind of hold it up for a minute. There we go, I love to see that. How many of you have an actual paper Bible? Why don't you hold that up and not one of these? That's amazing. That's amazing. I think I've told you this before, but when I was growing up in my little Baptist church, our pastor always said the sweetest sound he heard was the ruffling of the pages as people opened their Bibles. And I'm just like, I never get to hear that anymore. I see the warm glow of God's word on people's faces and I'll take it. I'll take it. But man, I love a paper Bible. And um, as we get into the subject matter for the weekend, James chapter four, I'm reminded of the story of the, of the small plane that had four people on board. A mother, two grown men, and a 14-year-old boy. When both engines suddenly went out and the plane sputtered and started to spiral toward the ground. To their dismay, these four passengers discovered that there were only three parachutes. So they all stared at the parachutes for a minute. And then the woman said, listen, I'm a mother of five and my kids need me. And she grabbed a parachute. And before anybody could say anything, she jumped. Then one of the two men said, well... I'm a brain surgeon and I'm literally one of the smartest people in the world. My patients, my community, shoot, my whole country needs me. So he grabbed the second parachute before anybody could object, he jumped. The third was an, an, an old elderly pastor and he said to the 14 year old boy, he said, son, I'm old, I'm frail. Why don't you take the last parachute? To which the boy said, sir, that's all right. There are still two parachutes left, one for each of us. The smartest man in the world just jumped out with my backpack. Um, I share that because at the end of chapter four and beginning of chapter five, it's not a true story, by the way, in case you wanna email me. Um, James, at the end of four, beginning of five, James aims to show the insanity of two groups whom society typically regards as wise and together. And I'm gonna call them the competent and the wealthy. James attempts to reason with both groups. He begins his address to each of them with the admonition, come now. Right, look at verse 13 of chapter four where we're gonna start. Look, you see the words come now? And then verse one of chapter five, you'll see, you'll see that again. Both sections start the same way. Come now, come now, verse 13, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a town and spend a year there and we will trade and we will make a profit. Let's go here. And let's do this because I think that's a good market and I think we can make a profit there. Most of us would call this planning and we would consider it a wise thing to do and it would be. In fact, in many places in your Bibles, planning is commended. The book of Proverbs says, in fact, that not to plan is foolish and lazy. The problem, James says, is not with the planning per se, it's with the posture behind the planning. You see, verse 14, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. For what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little time and then it vanishes. 
Instead, what you ought to say is, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, verse 16, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. The problem with the posture, the problem with the boastful posture behind your planning is that it assumes a godlike confidence, assuming that A, you're guaranteed tomorrow, and B, that you've got the ability to create your own future. But your life, James says, is as fleeting and as fragile and as insubstantial, verse 14, as the mist. Mist is the Greek word atmos, from which we get our word atmosphere. Some translations say vapor, but don't think of the, of the fog that hangs out for a couple of hours in the morning. It's not that kind of vapor. Think of it more like the steam that forms on your mirror if you blow on it in the morning. Seconds later, after you do that, it's gone with no trace that it was ever even there to begin with. That's what your life is like, James says. Three words. Three words, James says, describe our life, our lives. Number one, fleeting. Fleeting. The mist is just there for a moment, and then it's gone. Listen, life feels so long when you're in it, especially when you're young. But as you get older, I've heard, one of the disturbing things is how fast it all seems to have gone and how much quicker it goes every year. Older people, can I get a witness on that? I've heard it said that when you're a child, time crawls. When you're in college, time walks. When you're a new parent, time runs. When you're older, time flies. And when you hit retirement, time vanishes. Life is like a roll of toilet paper. Every revolution gets faster and faster, it seems. So to all of you college students and you young professionals, enjoy your flexibility, enjoy your vision. It ain't gonna last long. Here's your second word, forgettable. It said it's fragile, it's forgettable. The mist vanishes with no trace that it was ever even there. We are forgettable. We don't remember much of what came before us. You know, James's other analogy for this in chapter one was the grasses of the field. Look out over a grassy field and ask yourself, how many cycles of grass have actually grown there? Every season, a new batch comes in. Some of the blades of grass and that particular batch grew tall. Some stayed short. Some were pretty with flowers. Some of it was stubby and ugly, but all of it is now gone with no memory and, and a new crop that comes in every season. Kind of like when you walk back onto your old high school campus. You ever think that when you go back there, you're like, I used to rule here. Now nobody has any idea who I am and kids are like, who is the creepy old guy? Your lives are like that. In fact, can I prove it to you real quick? Answer this question. Okay, be totally honest. Raise your hands right now at any of our campuses if you could right now say the names of all four of your great-grandfathers. Raise your hand. Y'all, that is merely four generations and that's your very own blood and you don't even know their names. We are, humanly speaking, forgettable. I heard this point made by none other than that great philosopher, Kevin Durant. If you don't know, KD is one of the greatest NBA players of all time. He is a four-time NBA scoring champion, a two-time finals MVP, and an 11-time All-Star. He is one of those players whose decisions about where he's gonna play made some franchises wealthy and almost bankrupted whoever he left. Here's what he said in a recent interview. He said, the world is bigger than my little box and I'm not going to be playing this game forever. Then he said, he took his hands like this and he said, this is the KD box. Who gives up? And I'm not gonna say what he said. Who gives a expletive? There have been billions of people on this earth, he said, and my little box doesn't really amount to much of anything from a universe perspective. That's a pretty wise thing to say. And that brings me to the third word, fragile. Fragile, you can take a vapor and just wave it away with your hand. Our lives are fragile. The prophet Isaiah makes this point in a rather colorful way. He says, Isaiah 2.22, of what account is man whose life is in his nose? I love that. In other words, you can kill anybody. You can kill the toughest Navy SEAL just by clogging up his airways. James says, all your confident planning about tomorrow is arrogant because the smallest thing one little bacteria entering your body could change everything. Or imagine this. It's a bright, cloudless morning as a man looks out the window of his skyscraper office over one of the best views of New York City. 
He's an investor for Cantor Fitzgerald, which if you don't know, is one of New York City's most prestigious investment firms. In his hand, he holds a paper. His returns for the quarter have just come back three times bigger than what he'd hoped. His two twin sons have just started their freshman year at different Ivy League schools, both of them on full scholarships, one academic and one athletic. He's in great health. He just finished in the top 10 of the New York City Triathlon over 40 division. He is happily married. The cloudless horizon that he looks out over seems almost a metaphor for his future. Tomorrow, he thinks, I'm gonna invest in a new market and I'm gonna spend a year making a profit. Nothing but blue skies. The only problem is the date is September 11th, 2001. It's 8 a.m. in his 105th story office is in World One World Trade Center. Life is fragile and there's a whole host of things that can bring it down. Listen, your whole life could change with one unexpected phone call this afternoon. This is the highway patrol. You need to come down to the hospital immediately. Your wife has been in an accident or some unexpected things have showed up on your scans. And honestly, I know that's hard for some of you even to hear because you've received a call exactly like one of those before. But James just wants to remind you that your life is fragile. So what is James's counsel? In light of all this, James says, in light of your life being fleeting, forgettable, and fragile, he said, your life should be characterized by these three things. If you're taking notes, write down number one, humility. You need to live with the awareness of how much your life owes to God. Only the fool looks at his past and fails to see God's hand of grace in his successes. You know, it's interesting, and I find it interesting that even a growing number of secular thinkers seem to recognize this now. They don't attribute it to God, but they recognize that the idea of the truly self-made man or truly self-made woman is a myth. Some of you may have read Malcolm Gladwell's greatest, great little book called Outliers. Malcolm Gladwell is a secular intellectual. But in that book, he points out how much of our successes are ultimately outside of our control. Yes, your hard work contributed. But for you to be successful, you had to be in the right circumstances. Timing was huge. Your upbringing and your social networks also played a huge role, as have many other things that were outside of your control. Don't boast about your past successes failing to realize God's hand of grace in it. James says it is evil. That's what God struck down Nebuchadnezzar for in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar walked out one day and looked out over his kingdom and he thought, look at what I've built. And it was impressive, but he failed to acknowledge God's role in his success or to give God glory. He saw his accomplishments as a testament to his greatness. He boasted about them and God said, all right, we'll see about that. And with the flick of his finger, he made Nebuchadnezzar go insane and eat grass like a cow for seven years. Only the fool looks at his past and fails to see God's hand of grace in it. Even worse, only a fool looks at the future and thinks that it is under his or her control. God enables, God raises up, God empowers. And so James says, rather than boastfully saying tomorrow, I'm gonna do this or that, verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. Reject, even in your speech, he is saying, the arrogant assumption that you really are in control of your lives. Don't make God do something to prove that to you. Honestly, this is so unnatural for us Americans. We love this sense that we are the masters of our fates and the captains of our souls. At the end of the, of the Back to the Future series, Doc Brown says to Marty McFly, after all of his flying DeLorean adventures, Marty is trying to figure out what to do with the rest of his life. And Doc Brown says, the future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one, Marty. And as Americans, we're all like, yeah, we love that. The future is mine to create. Don't provoke God. The three most dangerous words in the English language might be, I got this, I got this. No, you don't, not necessarily. God determines that. By the way, I think we should take James literally here. We ought to say often when talking about our future, if the Lord wills. I don't think James is trying to impose some legalistic rule that you're gonna now you know, blow the whistle every time somebody talks about the future and doesn't say these words. But he's saying that we should acknowledge to ourselves and to others that ultimately we're not in charge of our lives, God is. 
It's how the apostle Paul talked. In Acts 18, 21, when Paul left Ephesus, he said, I will return to you again, if God wills. In 1 Corinthians 4, 19, he writes, I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. Paul didn't know if and when he went to a new town, it would end in revival or execution, maybe both. You are equally uncertain about your future and you should often acknowledge that. I found, by the way, that just saying those words cultivates humility in me. Here's a second word that should define a fleeting, forgettable, fragile life. Eternity. Eternity. Humility, eternity. If your life is a mist, then you need to actually think about what actually matters. If you think about how short your life is, compared to eternity. Several years ago, I saw a guy do an illustration that really (laughs) gripped me, I've never forgotten it. He said, pulled out something like this, and he said, let this rope right here, let this represent your life. This tiny red part, this is your life. So I don't know if you can see real close, maybe the camera will zoom in, but let's start right here. This is your birth. Then here's where you graduated high school, this little mark here. Then over here you got, that's when you you started to have kids, it was a great season. Then if you make it this long, get this long one right here that gets all the way over to your retirement. And let's just assume that this is when you die. So I don't know where you are in this. You know, I'm somewhere in this area. Maybe you're over here, okay? <laughs> Feels like a long time, doesn't it? And those of you that are in this stage, you're looking over here like, how old are you? <laughs> right? And then he said, but this... This is actually, this is just the first few days of eternity. And I could go on and on. He said, you know, if you look at this right here and you say, well, maybe, maybe if I eat kale salad and do all the right things, maybe use a standing desk, avoid wheat preservatives, rub myself down with unicorn oil or whatever else is trendy right now. Maybe you can add another couple of millimeters to this red, but bottom line, you're headed for this right here. How foolish is it to live for just that? I mean, just look at it. I mean, people love to say YOLO, you know, you only live once. Pack everything into this that you can. I've told you, that's dumb. If you want something to tattoo on your wrist or put on as a bracelet, do YALF. You actually live forever. Somebody's got their YOLO, you'd be like, YALF, not YOLO, YALF. One of my favorite verses, Psalm 90, verse 12. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to learn wisdom. Martin Luther translated that verse as teach us to think about death, that we might learn how to live only by pondering the inevitability of death and its relative imminence. Will you ever begin to live wisely if you've heard me tell my story about what brought me to Christ as a teenager, instrumental in that was the death of a friend in a car wreck. It was particularly gruesome. And as I stood there beside his closed casket, the illusion of my 16-year-old immortality was shattered. Death comes for us all. The question is, are you going to be ready for it? Do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? If you died this afternoon and you stood before God tonight, would you be ready? How is that not the most important question in your life? You're so busy working toward this or that or trying to accomplish this and build that and earn, 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 earn this over here and, and get your kid into this or that school. Do you ever stop and ask, what difference is any of that gonna make in eternity? Parents, some of you are so focused on getting your kids all the advantages, doing what it takes to get them into the right schools. Do you know that your kids know and that they love Jesus? Are you more focused on where they go to school than where they spend eternity? And Jesus said, what's it profit a man? If he gained the whole world, that little red portion of your life, if everything went right there, and then you lost your soul for eternity, what would it profit you? I always illustrate that to high school students. In fact, I did it recently by asking them, I'm like, okay, how many of you I mean, if, you, if I had a mountain of cash up on this stage, I mean like 10, let's think $10 million in cold, hard cash. And I offered it. I'll give it to anybody in this audience right now. If you will come up here on stage, put your hand on this table, let this person then come out in the back. He's gonna have a butcher knife. He's gonna cut off your pinky and you walk home with $10 million. How many of you do it? 
It's always interesting. It's about maybe 60% of the audience are like, I'd do that for $10 million. Disproportionately guys over girls every time. <laughs> I'm like, all right, let's up the stakes a little bit. Let's just not say it's your left pinky. Let's say it's your left arm up to your elbow. Mm, about a third of the hands go down. I'm like, let's raise the stakes one more time. Let's go up now to your shoulder. We're gonna cut off your shoulder, but you go home with $10 million. Starts getting little by little. Let's say 20% of the hands are still up. I'm like, all right, last, last offer. $10 million, but we're gonna cut off both arms, both legs. We're gonna poke out your eyes, cut out your tongue, stop up your nose. But you go home with $10 million. How many of you in? Not a single hand, except for one. There's always one guy. I don't know why it is, but <laughs> one guy. I'm like, put down your hand. Because most people would say, what good is $10 million if you have no faculties with which to enjoy it? And Jesus said, right. And some of you are giving away far, far more to gain far, far less. Are you prepared for eternity and you living for the things that matter? James' whole point is make the most of your mist. Like Amy Carmichael, the single missionary to India said, we will have all of eternity to celebrate the victories, but only a few hours before, before sunset to win them. Or what my dad always told me, only one life to live till soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. You know, my dad would always say to me, son, only two things in life last forever. You understand this? The word of God and the souls of people. So build your life around both of those. By the way, he's living that out even now. Many of you know my dad is an active member here at the Summit Church. He's an elder at the Capitol Hills campus. After my mom passed away last year, I mean, he misses her terribly, but he's not sitting around playing golf all the time or traveling the world. His schedule is filled up with people that he's meeting with. Some of them are investigating faith. Some of them he met right down here at the altar. Some of them are exploring a call to ministry. Y'all listen, he is busier than I am, and that is not a joke. I have a harder time getting on his schedule than he does on mine. And that's because he believes that only two things in life last forever. And it's not golf clubs or sports cars or Tahiti vacations. Only two things in life last eternally. And that is the word of God and the souls of people. So build every chapter of your life on them. Which if you'll give me a minute, always makes me think about the people around the world who've yet to hear the gospel. Whole people groups with no access at all in light of eternity. Is there anything more urgent for us to focus on? Anything more important for us to do with our money and our time? 10 seconds into eternity, will we have thought anything else was more important? Some of you need to consider doing this with your life. I realize you didn't grow up thinking this is what you do with your future, but if our lives are missed and eternity is forever, then getting the gospel around the world is what should characterize this brief, brief mist of a moment that we call life. Let your life be characterized by eternity. Live for the things that last forever. Make the most of your mist. Because we got all eternity to celebrate the victories, but only a few hours before sunset to win them. One more word, and then I'm gonna briefly hit those words in chapter five that are written specifically to the wealthy. But here's your third word. If we have lives that are fragile, fleeting, forgettable, then we should live lives that are characterized by humility, eternity. Here's your third word, immediacy. James ends this section, verse 17, by saying, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it's sin. You can read that in context. Because life is fleeting, fragile, fragile, and forgettable. Don't put off until tomorrow anything you know you should do today. If you were to die today, what would still be undone in your life? I love the words of another missionary, Jim Elliott. Make it such, Lord, that when it comes time in my life to die, all I have left to do is die. Don't wait to get saved. Don't wait to tell that person about Jesus. If you unexpectedly die tomorrow morning when you're standing in eternity, who are you gonna wish that you told about Jesus? Who are you gonna say, could I go back and have 10 minutes with that person? Don't wait to reconcile that relationship. Don't wait to say you're sorry. Make it such, Lord, that when it comes time in my life to die, all I got left to do is die. Don't wait to be generous. Don't be one of those people who save up all your money so you can live richly on it now, telling yourself that you're gonna instruct other people to be generous on your behalf when you die. 
James is saying, no, you be generous now. If you see something good in front of you to do and you fail to do it, it's sin. There are needs around you now. There are missionaries who need your support now. The church needs to do things to reach this community now. Don't wait to be generous. Be generous today. There's a wealthy man at our church. He's retired now. He told me, my goal, JD, is to give, to give all my money now so that my last check bounces. I said, so in other words, how you see this thing going down is the doctor tells you that you got 30 minutes left to live and you call me and a few of your family to your bedside and then you hand me a check for the church that's no good. <laughs> he said, yeah, that's about right. I said, could you write us your second to last check? That's what I want. <laughs> Here's the question. Is there anything God has put on your heart that you haven't done yet? It's like Veronica and I tell our kids, delayed obedience is disobedience. Make it such, Lord, that when it comes time in my life to die, all I got left to do is die. Whoever knows to do the right thing and fails to do it for him, it is sin. For lives that are fleeting, fragile, and forgettable, we should live lives that are characterized by humility, eternity, and immediacy. And now, with that at the forefront of your mind, I think you're ready for the first few verses of chapter five. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidenced against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Don't you love it? James, positive, encouraging. <laughs> Brother James. These two sections, in the chapter four and beginning of chapter five, really do tie together because, follow this, when you have a proud, look, a proud outlook on life, the place that will most often manifest is in how you spend your money. Money's not wrong, and being wealthy is definitely not a sin. But three things characterize proud, world center wealth. If you take a note, here's your first characterization. Verse three, letter A, hoarding. Hoarding, I don't mean you have a trailer and you got so much stuff in it and clothes from when you were 19 that I'm not talking about that kind of hoarding. I'm talking about hoarding your savings. James says, you have laid up treasures for the last days. Saving is not wrong, of course. In fact, Proverbs commends certain kinds of saving. Saving up money so that you're not a burden on others when you're older. Saving up money because you wanna provide for others. The book of Proverbs calls that wise. But just piling up wealth on earth, especially at the expense of generosity or in a way that ignores the needs of others, that's evil, James says. I know you say, well, how... How much, pastor? How much can you save up before it is considered hoarding? There's no magic number I can give you. You just need to take passage like this one seriously. At the Summit Church, we say that we should save sufficiently and give extravagantly rather than give sufficiently and save extravagantly. In fact, I would guess that most of you that I'm looking at right now, most of you give some and you save some. So the question is, which one do you do sufficiently and which one do you do extravagantly? Which leads me to the second thing James says that characterizes worldly wealth, self-indulgence, verse four. Self-indulgence, you have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. We're not talking about simply enjoying a few nice things, driving a reliable car, being able to bless your family with a college education or the occasional nice vacation. James is saying you live in a way that is totally disconnected from the people around you and their needs. And particularly when you do things to flaunt your wealth, when the clothes you wear, the bags you carry, or the cars you drive, or the watch you wear, the neighborhood you live in is supposed to make a statement about you. Now again, you say, how much, pastor, how much is too much? And again, I would say here, the question is one of proportion. I'd say most of you in here have some nice stuff and you give. So again, the question is, which one do you do sufficiently and which one do you do extravagantly? Do you live sufficiently and give extravagantly or do you give sufficiently and live extravagantly? I challenge you as a family, as a married couple, as a single, to write out these three words, write out the words spending, saving, and giving. 
and look at that and say, which ones of these do we do sufficiently and which ones do we do extravagantly? Characteristic number three, third word to characterize proud worldly wealth, injustice. James says in verse four that the way you got the money was by exploiting and defrauding others. James is probably not talking about outright theft here. In fact, he's talking about those ways that the wealthy can manipulate the legal system to keep people from their due. For example, employers who pay low wages or delayed wages just because they can or who, who use their wealth to manipulate the court system to benefit themselves, even if it's not entirely fair to others. Listen, I wanna be super careful here in how I say this. There are a lot of people in our tradition who oppose the Affordable Care Act. We hate discussions about raising the minimum wage. And I, I know many of you think that because you think those kinds of government impositions onto the market do more harm than good. Free enterprise, you say, is the only thing that prospers everybody in the society. And I am not here to debate that one way or the other. That is not my calling to tell you what to think about that. I understand that line of reasoning. And in many ways, I'm very sympathetic to it. What I'm saying is that Christians shouldn't need government mandated programs to treat their workers justly and fairly and generously. James is not talking about government programs here. James is saying that regardless of your politics or whatever political solutions you think help society, the poor around you are your responsibility. So if you run a business, your question is not only what am I legally required to do, it should be how can I take care of my employees in ways that are just, even generous? It means when you go and you eat at a restaurant, you tip not the bare minimum, you tip generously. It means that those in our small groups, in our neighborhoods, our kids, friends at school, we shouldn't need the government to tell us to take care of them. We should do it. They shouldn't have to take money out of our paycheck to do it. We ought to do it. In the early days of the church, the church was the soup kitchen. It was the orphan care. It was the foster care. It was welfare. Historian Eberhard Arnold notes about those first few centuries of Christianity. He says, most astounding, most astounding was the extent to which poverty, the outside observer, poverty was overcome in the vicinity of the communities through voluntary works of love. Christians spent more money in the streets than the followers of other religions spent in their temples. The Roman emperor Julian, one of the early Christians, primary persecutors said in disgust, it is a scandal that there is not a single Christian who is a beggar. These godless Galileans, that was his name for Christians are not only, they not only care for their own poor, but they care for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. That's a pretty good, pretty good thing when your critics are saying that about you. I don't think it's impossible to overstate how seriously God takes this. Just read the words in this chapter. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming on you. You've lived on the earth Verse five, in luxury and in self-indulgence, you fatten your hearts as in the day of slaughter. James says to rich people, you think you're living it up now. Your lives are fat with money. You live, you save extravagantly, but in God's eyes, you're just fattening yourself up for the day of slaughter. A couple of years ago, Veronica and I went on a mission trip to visit some of our missionaries in Germany and Eastern Europe. Two of the ones we went to see were Rich and Julia Rudolph, who were at the time living in this small rural village out on the German countryside. We got to their house really late at night, so we couldn't really take in our surroundings when we first got there. But when we got up the next morning, I pulled open the, the shade. I'm like, Veronica, come, come look at this, because out of our window was the most idyllic German hillside I'd ever laid my eyes on. Six or seven sheep grazing on this vast green hillside, flanked by the mountains. The windmill you could see off in the distance. At any moment, I was expecting a little Swiss Miss girl with blonde pigtails to come dancing or Captain Von Trapp to come out singing Edelweiss or something like that. It was perfect. I mean, perfect. And these sheep looked like they were living the dream. Right? Just nothing but grazing all day long in this amazing countryside, but only word, one word popped in my mind when I saw those sheep. Mutton or lamb shanks. I guess that's two words, but... You see, right over the hillside, you could see the slaughterhouse. And these sheep were being prepared for the day of slaughter. Their idyllic lives were just an illusion. James says that this is what the lives of the rich are like. This hoarding, self-indulgent, luxurious life is just fattening you up for when God executes justice on behalf of the poor. 
Here's the question James wants those of us who have money to consider. Why did God give you that? After all, what we saw in James 4 was at the end of the day, it was God who made you rich, right? That was his point in James 4, God did that. You have to ask, what was his purpose in making you rich? At the summit, we use the word steward to describe our relationship with our finances. A steward understands that none of what they have truly belongs to them. Everything, our time, our treasure, and our talents are given to us by God for a purpose. And our responsibility as stewards is to figure out what that purpose is and fulfill it. So if you are blessed with a lot, you have to ask, why did God give me this? And the answer is, he gave it to you so that you could channel it to the needs around you. He didn't give it to you for you to hoard or to live in self-indulgence. You parents, say that you learn that there's a really poor kid at your kid's school who never has anything to eat at lunch. So as you're preparing your son's lunch for the day, you pack him two of everything. Two Lunchables, two juice boxes, two packs of goldfish. But you get busy and you forget to tell him why you did that. All he knows is that when he opens up his lunchbox at Lunch, he's got two of everything, and right beside him is this kid with nothing. As a parent, what do you hope that he does instinctively? Do you hope that he eats two of everything? He sits back and says, mom and dad love me so much, and I've been such an awesome son lately that I've been rewarded with two packs of Oreos. And then he gobbled it all down, saying that I'm glorifying the generosity of my parents by eating two of everything. That's what the prosperity gospel people will tell you that you're doing. Or do you hope that he takes the second Lunchable and stealthily finds a place that he can hide it in case you forget about him tomorrow? That way, if you forget, now he's got a spare lunch saved up and he's ready for a rainy day. Is that what you hope he does? Or are you most pleased if instinctively, without instructions or commands, he hands the extra lunch stuff to the kid who has none? If he did that, would you say, oh, well, great. Now my kid's never gonna be rich because he doesn't know how to save. There goes the whole free market system right there up in smoke. No, my guess is that you'd be supremely pleased that his instinct was to share and not to hoard because you know, and you know that he should know that you're gonna pick, you're gonna pack another lunch for him tomorrow and he's got nothing to worry about. So why would you think God is pleased when we pile up our money in extravagance in case God doesn't take care of us tomorrow? God made you wealthy, James says to the rich, to give so you can meet needs. He prospers you not so you can just increase your standard of living, but also so you can increase your standard of giving. At the Summit Church, we teach that three words ought to characterize your giving. If you're a follower of Jesus, priority, that means giving should come out first, not last. It is the first thing Veronica and I do every single month. We call it the first fruits. Before anything else gets spent, we say, we say I, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put this first in my life. You say, but if I do that, I won't be able to make the rest of my ends meet. Yo, listen, all I can tell you is I've done it now for 40 years and God has always been faithful. And I've heard countless testimonies of, in this church of people who experience the same thing. He promises multiple places in our Bibles that if you put him first, he will make sure you are sufficient in all the rest of your needs. In fact, in Malachi, he actually says, test me, just try it and see if I won't be faithful in how I come through. Priority, second percentage. One of the ways you can bring discipline to your giving is by setting a percentage each month. We're not talking about just throwing in your lunch money into the plate whenever the pastor talks about it. Tithe literally means 10%. And that's a great starting point for us. But that leads to the third word, and that is progressive. As God prospers you and me, we are to increase that percentage year by year. Veronica and I were given 10% when we were bootstrapping it as new college graduates. But now that we have more means than we did, we have year by year tried to progress our percentage. I would encourage you to, to consider the same. Let's return to our central thread. Our lives are fleeting, forgettable, and fragile. So we should live lives that are characterized by humility, eternity, and immediacy in regards to money and all other areas. Only the fool lives as if this mist is all there is. Live for eternity. And don't we have an incredible model in doing so? Jesus, who used his brief stint on earth not to pile up treasure and power, but to pour his life out as a sacrifice for joy, the writer of Hebrews tells us. Jesus endured the cross. He embraced the sacrifice. He despised its shame. Despised its shame means he didn't even think about it. 
He didn't think about the sacrifice. You don't want to know why? Because he lived with his mindset in eternity. He knew the sacrifice was temporary, but the people he was saving were eternal. That's how you and I should live. Because only two things in life last forever, the word of God and the souls of people. So build your life on them. Why don't you bow your heads if you would. I've asked some weighty questions today. Your life is brief. It could be over today if it were. What would you most regret? What would remain undone? Have you received Christ? Let's start there. Have you received Christ? Are you sure that you're sure that you've received him? If not, friend, you could do that right now. You say, how do I do that? You just say, Lord Jesus, I'm ready. I surrender my life to you and I'm ready to receive you as my savior. Do that right now. Lord Jesus, I receive you. I surrender to you. If that's you, all I would ask is that you come up and you tell one of us before you leave or you text the word ready to 33933. Do one of those two things. Come up and tell us at the end of the service or whatever campus you are or text the word ready to 33933 and let's get that conversation started because you need to get baptized. How about this? Does everybody in your life know about Jesus? Who do you need to hear? Who's, who do you need to tell? Whose name just popped in your heart right now? Who do, you need to, who do you need to call this afternoon? What about global missions? Some of you right now, the spirit of God is tugging at you. You're like, I wasn't expecting this, but he's tugging at you. He's saying, hey, this is, you need to think about this. Will you at least begin to pray about it? What act of obedience have you delayed? What ministry do you need to start? Maybe you need to make changes to your generosity habits. I don't know, but I wanna leave you here with the Holy Spirit for just a few minutes, a few moments. I want you to let him do whatever work in your heart that he wants to do. And then our, our worship teams are gonna come. I want you to sit there with the Holy Spirit for a minute. They'll come in a moment.